A gościem w Mina 20 jest Bill Browder, człowiek, który niegdyś był największym zagranicznym inwestorem w Rosji, a dziś na świecie nazywany jest największym wrogiem Władimira Putina. Mr. Browder, welcome to Mina 20, welcome to Polish Television. Great to be here. Mr. Browder, before we start, uh, could you explain our viewers uh, how did it happen that uh, uh, you are considered uh, Vladimir Putin number one enemy? Well, what, what happened was that um, I exposed uh, massive corruption in Russia um, when I was running an investment fund business there in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, uh, I was expelled from the country. My offices were raided. My lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, um, <clears throat> investigated the office raid and discovered that the, a bunch of um, senior law enforcement officers and government officials had used documents taken from our office to steal $230 million of taxes that we paid. Um, We exposed that. My lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, testified against the officials involved. He was subsequently arrested, uh, tortured for 358 days to get him to retract his testimony, which he refused to do, and then ultimately killed on November 16, 2009. Um, it's been my mission since he was murdered at justice for him. And I was able to achieve some measure of justice through a piece of legislation called the Magnitsky Act which started in the United States and has now spread to a number of other countries. And the Magnitsky Act um, freezes the assets and bans the visas of the people who killed him and the people who do similar types of things in Russia. And Vladimir Putin hates this more than anything else because it completely hits him in his Achilles heel. He and the members of his regime do terrible crimes in Russia for money and then keep that money offshore in the West. And by passing the Magnitsky Act in the United States and Canada, in the UK, and uh, all the Baltic nations, uh, we've now started to put at risk Putin's money, which makes him very angry and very angry at me. Mr. Brother, you claim that uh, Vladimir Putin uh, is probably one of the richest men in the world. Uh, you assume that uh, he might be worth $200 billion dollars. How come? What are, what, how, how, did you, how did you get th this specific number? Well, the, the, um, the analysis is quite simple. That Vladimir Putin, uh, around 2004, after he arrested the richest oligarch in Russia, Michael Hordakovsky, and put him on trial, um, he was basically then uh, meeting with all the other oligarchs who were all saying to him, what do we have to do not to get arrested like Hordakovsky? And that was when he presented his deal, the grand bargain of Russia, which was 50%. He wanted 50% of their assets in exchange for leaving them alone. And just about all the oligarchs agreed. A few of them didn't, and they had to flee, and, and some of them have been killed. Um, and the ones that have agreed um, basically hold 50% of his assets. And so my calculation is very simple, which is what are the oligarchs worth? Multiply that by 50%. But uh, that means that uh, the money is the uh, real deal and the real issue and the real reason why uh, Vladimir Putin takes uh, the position that he's holding right now. He just decided that he's going to be a president of Russia for next uh, six years. On his uh, first public appearance, he joked that he will not stay on this position until uh, he's 100 years old. Will he ever resign? Can he resign? No, Vladimir Putin cannot resign. Um, he's in a very un untenable position because he spent all these years, 18 years now, terrorizing, committing crimes, doing terrible things in his own country. He stole an enormous amounts of money, murdered many people, committed many grave war crimes. And so if Putin were ever to step down, first of all, he would lose his money, which uh, none of the money is held in his own name. It's all held in other people's names. Uh, second of all, he would probably go to jail. And if he were in jail, then third of all, of course, he would fear for his own life. And so as a matter of physical survival, Vladimir Putin has to stay in power. And so I think it's completely nonsense, whatever he says or doesn't say, uh, Vladimir Putin will be um, in the presidency until he either dies of natural causes or is overthrown. We are right after the so-called uh, election uh, process in, uh, in, um, in, in Russia, but you, on several occasions, you said that the only way uh, of uh, somehow 
tackling uh, Putin's kleptocracy is hitting Putin's mafia financial uh, tools. Do you think that this is really possible? I mean, banning, for example, Russia or the, or the, or, or the Putin oligarchs from the international banking operation, it still didn't happen. Magnitsky Act is a major tool, it works, Russia doesn't like it, but Russia is still a part of this international banking system. Well, the, the answer is that, that there's a lot more that can be done by the countries that already have the Magnitsky Act. There's only 49 people on the U.S. Magnitsky list so far. There's only 30 Russians on the Canadian Magnitsky list. There's also a lot more countries um, that can get involved. Now, Poland does not, does not have a Magnitsky Act yet. I'd like Poland to have a Magnitsky Act. There's no reason why Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia should have it, and, and Poland doesn't. Um, and, uh, and I believe very strongly that um, if uh, Magnitsky sanctions are applied liberally and, and decisively, this will completely change Putin's calculus because it's the one place where we have real significant and, and noticeable leverage on him. And it should be used and it should be used aggressively. So you would uh, encourage the Polish government to try to set up uh, uh, some kind of Magnitsky law in Poland yeah. as well? That's correct. I think that Poland is a very right candidate for a Magnitsky law. Um, I'd be very keen to work with um, uh, Polish members of parliament to put it in place. And, uh, and I'd be very happy if Poland could become the eighth country to, to post Magnitsky Act. Okay, but on the other hand, we got uh, very important ties, financial ties between uh, Putin's Russia and major European countries. Uh, we have this problem regarding, for example, Nord Stream 2 and relations between Germany uh, and uh, Russia. Isn't it uh, also a, a political, internationally important and difficult issue for European, uh, even the, the major European countries, um, to, to have the knowledge that you have? Because obviously, obviously this knowledge is in the in the possession of the most important political players, and on the other hand, being tackled uh, uh, or being tied with Russia in uh, business projects like Nord Stream Two. Well, I mean, it, it, it's it's pretty clear that there are people that Russia has very deliberately created financial ties with certain major um, organizations and companies and people in order to, to create this exact situation where where in order to punish Russia for its bad behavior, it will cost money. Um, having said that, whatever money it costs, it's national security, the safety, uh, the safety of the people, the safety of our borders, the safety of our skies is infinitely more important than some narrow financial interest that will be impacted. And so I think that it's um, very important uh, that, that these projects like the Nord Stream or like British Petroleum's uh, investment in, in uh, Russia um, aren't used as a way to sabotage the safety of people in Europe. You mentioned the safe skies. Uh, you are, of course, referring, and you mentioned it in the several interviews, uh, to the MH17 uh, case and shooting down of the um, airplane flying to Malaysia. But in Poland, we are also asking ourselves the question of the 2010 Smolensk uh, crash, a plane with the Polish president on board. What's your thoughts after those eight years on this issue? Do you find this uh, case uh, um, already investigated, already clear? And do you find Putin's regime capable of of uh, uh, melding with this kind of uh, uh, catastrophe? I, I think that, that um, uh, I, there's just too many, too many different um, uh, suspicious deaths, suspicious accidents, murders, etc. cetera, um, uh, for, for anyone to, to not look at the, um, the, the Smolensk uh, plane crash with, with huge degree of skepticism. Uh, I'm not an expert on the forensic investigation, but what I can say is that um, uh, it's not beyond Putin to kill a head of state if, if, he, if he thinks he can get away with it, if there's plausible deniability. And um, I've seen it in many other cases that I know where the investigations I know intimately, and I know how Putin behaves, and they try to, they basically lie and cheat and, and, and um, fabricate in order to get out of their legal liability, and that happened with the Magnitsky murder, that happened with the Parapolichny case, um, um, uh, the, the death of a whistleblower um, in London, and it's happened in many other situations. And so um, uh, I, I wouldn't put it past Putin to have done something to sabotage that plane. 
Okay, uh, Mr. Broder, uh, the, the, the final question of this uh, uh, part of uh, our conversation. Uh, we are uh, witnessing from this side of, uh, of the Atlantic Ocean uh, this, the, the case that it's uh, called Russian collusion case in the uh, uh, United States. It all started from the meeting that your case and Magnitsky case was discussed between uh, Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, Paul Manafort and, and, and a Russian lawyer that you are familiar with. What's your thoughts after those uh, days on, uh, on, on this whole case? And what's your thoughts on, on Donald Trump's policy towards Russia? Those are his tweets on one hand, but on the other hand, for example, deployment of the American troops here in uh, Central Europe, which surely Russia doesn't like. Well, it, it's pretty clear to me that, that there's a huge difference between the, the offensive tweets that Donald Trump puts out praising Putin and the actions of his, his administration. Um, I, I would actually argue that the U.S. Uh, foreign policy towards Russia under Trump has actually been tougher than the U.S. foreign policy towards Russia under Obama. And we've seen uh, offensive weapons being supplied to Ukraine under, under in the Trump administration. We've seen very high-profile Russian government officials being added to the Magnitsky sanctions list. As you mentioned, there's lots of U.S. troops being deployed in Poland and other, other countries in the Baltics. And so I think that it's, it's a very schizophrenic situation. And thank, thankfully, um, you know, Trump's tweets don't, don't actually um, materialize into change of policy. It is, it is very interesting and odd that my case and the case of Magnitsky was the one thing that the Russian government came to Trump, Donald Trump's family prior to the election, asking for the Magnitsky Act to be repealed and asking for me to be arrested. Um, it just shows how sensitive Putin is to the whole Magnitsky case. Uh, but there's also been a benefit in that particular story because uh, now the whole of the United States knows about the Magnitsky Act because of this uh, request that the Russians made Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and Paul Manafort. Okay, uh, the, thank you for this part of uh, conversations um, to all of our viewers. A my dziękujemy za rozmowę z Billem Broderem. Do zobaczenia. Okay, Mr. Broder, again, could you explain why, in your opinion, this Magnitsky Act is an existential threat or might be an existential threat for Vladimir Putin's uh, uh, regime? And on several occasions, you mentioned that this is their uh, uh, international policy goal number one to, uh, to get rid of this uh, act in the United States. We should understand that Putin doesn't run Russia like a normal head of state. He's running effectively a criminal enterprise in which he is the mafia boss. And his criminal enterprise, the primary objective is to steal as much money from the Russian state as they can in a shorter period of time. And they keep that money in the West. And they keep that money in British banks and American banks and Swiss banks, etc. And so by coming up with the Magnitsky Act, and the Magnitsky Act freezes assets and bans visas of people who killed Sergei Magnitsky and people who do other human rights abuses in Russia, um, I've effectively put Putin's own business model at risk. And the idea that he, he no longer can keep his money safe is very terrifying and for him. And, and, and moreover, um, by doing so, it puts at risk his own standing with the people underneath him, because they're all assuming that they're going to be um, uh, imp uh, immune from a prosecution. Um, and that's true in Russia, but it's not true in the West. Effectively, we've come up, come up with a way of creating consequences to people who work for him. And again, that changes the whole risk-reward of doing bad things, where now there's a risk of having your assets frozen and your visas canceled. And so when Putin says, don't worry, nothing's going to happen, he can't say that with any credibility now with the existence of the Magnitsky Act. Okay, but you, you mentioned a very interesting uh, business uh, phrase, a business model of the, of the whole, I don't know, crime corporation that is being run by Vladimir Putin. Uh, when we are talking about a regular businessman, you are a businessman by yourself, you worked with the people's money. When a regular businessman wants to withdraw, withdraw his money or wants to use his money to pay for something or to buy something, he just uses his company's uh, account or he uses his own money. How does it work in case of uh, a person who is, as you mentioned, an owner of the 50% of the, shadow, uh, of the shares, but he is not officially uh, an owner? How can he use it? And what is the 
procedure in this kind of uh, situation. Well, Putin right now, um, he calls up an oligarch who holds money for him, and he says, um, please wire money to so-and-so. And, -so. and um, the oligarch will, of course, listen to Putin and do what he's told, because that's the deal. But however, this is not a very long-term sustainable situation, because everybody in Russia is, is greedy. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, dishonesty among oligarchs. They say there's no honor among thieves. And so if Putin was ever not to be in power, and he then made a phone call saying, wire a billion dollars here, um, the oligarch would, would, would say, huh, who are you? And then hang up the phone. And so Putin's own um, access to money is completely dependent on him being in power. And so this whole situation is a very tenuous situation. His wealth is not firm, it's not clear, it's not independent, in the sense that everybody is dependent on everybody, and he's dependent on power. So does he have um, uh, access to the money that he owns, or he just needs some kind of leverage, I don't know, threats, murders, any other activities that uh, make him, uh, that, 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 that make using of this money and of, of this power that he's owning possible? Um, he has no direct access. Everything is in other people's names. If he had direct access, that would be used for blackmailing him, which he doesn't want to create the uh, situation where people can do that. So his entire, um, his entire wealth is in the hands of other people, and it's dependent on them behaving the way he wants them to behave, which at the moment they do, but that's not certain in the future. Okay, Mr. Broder, um, uh, we are, again, I'll come back to the so-called elections uh, in uh, Russia that we, are just, uh, that we just witnessed uh, a couple of uh, days uh, uh, ago, uh, when we are thinking about uh, this uh, whole uh, system, when we are uh, trying to find out what is the real approval rating of Vladimir Putin, and again, on several occasions you said that it is not based on lies, but it is based on frauds. So what is the difference? Why do you find this, uh, why do you make this distinction? Well, I, I, I think it's based on lies and fraud, but basically, so um, Putin is not a legitimate uh, democratic leader, and I appreciate you calling it so-called elections because that's, that's true, it's not real elections. Um, Putin has eliminated all of his candidates, all of the opposition candidates by either killing them, arresting them, or exiling them. Uh, Putin has, controls completely the airways of Russia, the television, the radio, the internet, and he completely changes the story. If, if the Russian people knew how much money he was stealing and how bad their lives are because of him, his approval ratings would drop from 80% uh, 2% overnight. And so we're in this strange situation where because of the elimination of competition and because of the control of the media, um, you have, you have a, a, a total fake election and you have a fake public support. And there are people who probably support him based on the information they know, they wouldn't support him if they had any idea of what he was up to. And they probably wouldn't support him if somebody like Alexei Navalny were running against him in a free and fair election. And so I, I just don't think it's, it's right to even call what happened there an election. It's more like a, um, a Politburo confirmation. You compared it um, in one of the recent interviews to the situation in some of uh, small African countries when, when there, were, there were dictators for several years that were having uh, approval ratings uh, on the level of 70 or 80 percent or even higher. Why do you find it similar? Well, I mean, basically, he is a um, tin pot dictator. Um, his approval ratings will only stay high as long as he's in power. The moment that he gets overthrown for any reason, it will go to zero percent, like it did with Mugabe and other people. Um, uh, he's stealing the entire resources of the country from his people for his own financial benefit, which is very similar to Africa. And so I really view this most similar to an African kleptocracy and dictatorship. Okay, uh, my final question. We are all uh, witnessing the worldwide reactions to the assassination uh, attempt of uh, Siege Skripal, uh, but we find it difficult to understand why did Vladimir Putin decided to do it. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? What is the reason why, why a country like Russia decides to act so violently on the, on the territory of, uh, of other sovereign states, which is Great Britain? Well, this was a message to his own security services in Russia. 
um, the people who, who do all of his dirty work for him, which is that um, if you ever think about being disloyal, um, if you ever betray the country, it doesn't matter where you go, it doesn't matter how long ago you, you, you committed your treason, um, Putin's saying to them, we're going we're to come for you, we're going to find you, we're going to kill you, we're going to kill your family. That's the message to his own people. I don't think Skripal himself was a particularly dangerous mole. He, he isn't him now, but I think he was back in the day. And, and this is a way to say, say to everybody else, don't even think about doing that. So it's just a message to be sent, in your opinion. Uh, okay, so do you feel safe uh, as uh, being named uh, all over the world Vladimir Putin primary enemy? Um, I don't feel safe. If he wants to kill me, he will. Um, I'm not living in fear. I'm just going on my life and doing what I need to do, um, hoping that uh, it becomes you know, too, high, too high a political pr price to kill me. But um, I can't count on that, and so I just got to... Take each day as it comes. Thank you very much for this uh, conversation. Uh, to all the viewers all around the world, um, all the information on the details of this case uh, can be found in the book Red Notice, which is available all around the world. And Bill Broder is an author of this book and was a guest of Minad Vujesta. Thank you very much. Thank you.